Exodus 20, 14, you shall not commit adultery. One, adultery, as it's here translated, porneia is the Greek word, according to the Bible, is a comprehensive term meaning fornication, adultery, perversion, any kind of sexual immorality or any inner disposition thereto. Please note what I think is the proper definition of the word which is usually translated adultery. It's a Greek word, it's Hebrew equivalent, has the same kind of flexibility uh, about it. Adultery, as a translation of the Greek word porneia, according to the Bible, now it may not be the same way in legal textbooks or in your state or something like that, but according to the Bible, porneia is a comprehensive term, meaning fornication, adultery, perversion, any kind of sexual immorality. See, that's the thing about it, objectively considered. This word porneia is exemplified by the word adultery, but it is not exhausted by that word. Any kind of sexual immorality is subsumed under that term porneia. Porneia is in wide use today because of the term pornography, pornographic literature, child pornography, and all the ways in which that term derived from the Greek word porneia, which our Lord used, is so widely circulated. But I also remind you, in the light of what we've said about the nature of virtue and vice, it's not only any kind of sexual immorality, but any inner disposition there too. So that when our Lord was dealing with the seventh commandment, he says, if a man looks upon a woman to lust after her, he has committed adultery with her in his heart. They hear the mere, it's not just a desire now to have a person, in this case a man, to have a woman uh, carnally, but it's the intention to carry it out. In other words, it's not just a general sexual appetite, which is common to man and woman, but it's beyond that to the point of actually uh, intending to have this particular woman, not your spouse, carnally. It may never get beyond that into actual carnal relationship, but according to Jesus Christ, that man has committed adultery in his heart. Remember, he keeps insisting that God is a searcher of hearts, and he knows hearts, and people who can say they have never committed the act of adultery have to be able to say they have never intended the act of adultery to be free of the charge of breaking the seventh commandment. So the in inner disposition is very definitely a part of the uh, commandment. And uh, I don't know whether I mentioned this before or may again, but uh, Luther's immortal words are uh, irresistibly forcing themselves upon my attention at the moment. He distinguishes between this general desire as over against a specific purpose to commit an act of adultery, even though one does not carry it out, as the difference between having, a, having the birds fly over your head, which you can't prevent, and they're nesting in your hair, which you can prevent. Having temptation in general is one thing. Inwardly yielding to that, letting the birds nest in your hair, is the first succumbing to porneia and is a violation of the seventh commandment, whether you ever actually have a carnal relationship with someone, not your spouse, or not. Number two, venereal diseases, gonorrhea, herpes, syphilis, AIDS, and others are divine punishments or chastisements for these sins. Now here again, I think you're aware of the fact that this is exactly what most all of the columnists say is not the case. Every time this subject is brought up, as apparently questioners are always bringing it up, 
The columnists will usually assure you this is not a divine punishment. You should not consider even AIDS to be a reflection of divine displeasure with your behavior. Now, I am saying they are quite precisely and exactly wrong in so informing people and in so doing are actually contradicting holy uh, scripture. These are divine punishments. Now, I'm going to explain in what follows here why I make that severe statement so out of line with most of what is being said often even in religious columns. But always, I know of hardly any exception, in secular columns, first of all, I mention in item number three, all suffering is punishment for sin, and VD is suffering. So all I have to show you is the first part of this to be true, and the latter part, and the whole indictment of these sexual diseases as being punishments from God will necessarily follow. So let me try to show you what I mean by saying the Bible teaches all suffering is punishment for sin. You may be surprised by that statement because of a number of things you may read into the statement, but please uh, be patient with me as I explain what is being said here and as well as what is not being said. All suffering is punishment for sin. I may say if this lecture were more informal than it actually is and I was seeing you face to face instead of just making a, a videotape and could give out cards and uh, put this statement on the board without any comments about it and just ask you to say, is that a true or a false statement? All suffering is punishment for sin. I think most of you would say false. I'm not giving out the cards and I don't have an audience here, but to that imaginary audience, I'm asking you now. I'll pause two seconds for your answer there. If I had not showed you that I thought this is a false statement so that I might have some influence on your judgment, at least to make you hesitate a little before you gave a true or false answer, try to put yourself before that and be confronted fresh at the outset, the first sentence in this particular lecture with this proposition, all suffering is punishment for sin, as whether you'd say f a true or false, what you would have said. Now, the reason I say that punishment or it should be or chastisement, this may hang some of you up and I'll explain that in a moment here, but uh, generally, when we talk about this particular statement, we're thinking about uh, it in general terms and not the precise situation of Christians redeemed by Jesus Christ. All suffering is punishment for sin. All suffering. See, that suffering is sometimes a punishment for sin, but all suffering. And no one has ever suffered who hasn't sinned. No one has ever suffered who hasn't deserved his suffering. He may not have received all that he deserves, but whatever he received in the way of suffering, he deserved. That's what that statement means, and that statement, I believe, is true. Now, the way I would prove it is this. God teaches us plainly that the wages of sin is death. And everything, presumably, that leads to that, because mortality was a consequence of the original sin. If it had been no sin, there would be no death, there'd be no suffering. We agree with that, don't we? In the garden, there was no sin and suffering. In heaven, there's going to be no sin and suffering. In the triune Godhead, there's no sin or suffering. In hell, where there's nothing but sin, there's nothing but suffering. They are definitely associated. You wouldn't have one uh, without the other. You can't have the punishment without the suffering. You can't have the suffering without it being a form of punishment of God because of uh, sin. And just those observations would uh, should, I think, secure that proposition. It's the wages of sin that's death. The wages of virtue is life. You don't have anything but health and life and prosperity and blessedness with virtue. You have nothing but suffering and misery and de death with sin, so that all suffering is a punishment for sin. Now, if you say, but Christ who never sinned, 
was punished. You know the answer to that. He didn't sin in his person, but he identified himself with our sin. He who knew no sin became sin. He is the most classic illustration we have of suffering being the punishment for sin. Once the very Son of God, in whom he was infinitely well pleased, became identified with our sin, there was no place for him except death. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He knew why. Because thou art a purer eyes than to behold iniquity. And he was like that serpent lifted up in the wilderness. When even the Son of God, the spotless, sinless Son of God, became identified with sin, there was no place for him but the cross. Don't ever think that's an exception to the rule when it's the most classic and perfect illustration of the rule you can possibly get. So I say all suffering. Now manifestly, if all suffering is a punishment for sin, then surely VD, which is a form of suffering, is a punishment for sin. But it has not just a general relation, but a specific relation. That is, it's a particular type of immoral sexual behavior that brings this particular type of sin. A man is born blind, and the question is raised, who sinned, this man or his parents? And Christ says, this man is born blind for the glory of God. He's not denying that this man sinned or that this man's blindness was connected with sin. What he is denying is that it was not also for the glory of God. These things are not always spelled out in the Bible, but there wouldn't be any blindness if Adam had never fallen. Nobody is going to be blind in heaven. There's not going to be any blindness or any kind of suffering where there is no sin. But the sin in the particular case in John 9 that I'm referring to now was not the immediate product, presumably, of anything he did. He wasn't careless with the use of his eyes, for example, or anything like that necessarily. It's just that sin in general is a punishment for, uh, uh, brings, a, brings suffering in general. But VD is suffering which grows out of a specific form of sin, namely sexual immorality, usually. There are often persons who contract this innocently, that is, innocent of any sexual immorality in the overt world by their uh, relationship to a person who has incurred it in the first instance by his own sexual immorality. But what I'm saying here is that when the columnists assure you that AIDS and all these other diseases are in no way punishments from God or even reflections of God's displeasure with you, they are lying. And doing worse than that, they're calling God a liar when he insists that anybody who does what is right will never know sin unless, like his son, he takes it vicariously for someone else. Number five. I've already alluded to number four here, so I, let me skip directly to number five. But Christ did not say that innocent people suffer. We know Christ would not say that because his word teaches that the thoughts of men's heart are only evil continually. There is no such thing as an innocent person. A person may be innocent of any sexual immorality that it may have brought uh, disease or any use of contaminated needles, he may have gotten it by an accidental contact of some sort. We find cases such as that. But that person, look, the person who gets AIDS because of sexual immorality gets it directly from his sexual immorality. The person who gets AIDS <coughs> without being sexually immoral in practice but contacted by an accidental infection with a person who has the disease is innocent of sexual immorality, but he's not innocent of sin. Just because he hasn't committed the particular sin which produces AIDS doesn't mean he hasn't committed sin which deserves AIDS. If every sin deserves AIDS, it manifestly deserves AIDS. 
AIDS is just a slap on the wrist on God's part as far as what a sin does deserve. It's just a warning to people that if they do not repent, they will certainly perish forever. We get aghast at the idea that anybody would say venereal disease is a punishment for sexual sin when as a matter of fact it is in no way an adequate punishment for sexual or any other sin. It's just the merest intimation that God is displeased with his behavior and that if you do not repent, you will have his displeasure forever inflicted upon you in hell itself. But to read that sentence once again, we know Christ would not say that they are innocent people because his word teaches that the thoughts of men's heart are only evil. Whether it's sexual evil or some other, they're only evil continually. Genesis 6, 5, therefore they are converted and not without sin before they are converted and they're not without sin afterwards. There are no innocent people. All men are sinners. Perhaps I better at this particular point just remind you of this one point. Once a person is converted, suppose, for example, a man with AIDS or a woman with AIDS is converted and recognizes that the behavior in which he or she has engaged before was a very heinous violation of the commandments of God and that the disease with which he is now inflicted is a punishment of God, he still has it after he's converted, perhaps is destined to die because of it. But that is now changed from punishment to chastisement for the simple reason that Christ has endured the punishment of his sin, including his immoral sin which brought on AIDS, and it now pursues him not as a punishment because the punishment has been endured by Christ, it is now no longer a punishment indicating the divine wrath and hostility against him. It is, the puni it is the punishment of a father who loves his child and therefore chastises him. And while this previous punishment was a mark of doom, this punishment we call chastisement is a mark of divine favor and a guarantee of everlasting life because it is an evidence of the father's love, not of his wrath. He's doing this because this child has to be disciplined in the ways of righteousness. But it's still true that this would never have occurred if it hadn't been for sin. All punishment and all chastisement in the last analysis would never have occurred if it hadn't been for sin, even though the chastisement which falls upon a Christian because of past sins and so on is now an act of love of a heavenly father and not the punishment of a wrathful deity because of unredeemed and unatoned sin. I trust you get the difference there. We've touched on it before. We'll come back to it again. And uh, this is one thing I miss in these lectures, I may say, is a live discussion with you. As, it's used, as these lectures may be used in videotapes and audio tapes in churches, I hope that there'll be a half an hour left after the listening to one of these for discussions from the group. I wish I were there in some cases. Of course, there's no point of my being there. You've already heard my comments. It's more important for somebody else to be there and to listen to my comments and your comments and try to work out things to a common understanding. Number seven, so someone's AIDS may not be merely because of sin, but that suffering would cause him to call on Christ and be saved. There I'm liking it to uh, the man born blind, you see. It would be the same thing as saying somebody asking why this man had AIDS. Was it because of something his parents done or something that he had done? And Christ saying, this man's AIDS is for the glorification of God. It's going to lead to that man's conversion just as truly as the man's blindness led to his conversion. You see, for a person who's been inflicted with AIDS, which ultimately leads him to call upon God for mercy, because, not because of his AIDS, because, but because of the sin that produced his AIDS, the AIDS is going to become a means for the glory of God. 
And it could well be that that redeemed Christian afterwards will quite soberly thank God for AIDS. Thank God he was cut down in the midst of his crime. Thank God he was inflicted with a mortal disease. Thank God he only has two months to live. But in those months after his contamination with this disease, his sin was brought home to him. He called upon Jesus. He was saved. Well, of course, he wouldn't really thank God for AIDS because it's a divine judgment. He would thank God for what God had done through his AIDS and the curing not only of his AIDS and its guilt, but of actually curing his sin and its guilt and saving him forever and ever. Number eight, after salvation, it remains as a chastening of one whom God loves as before it was a punishment of one whom God hated with perfect hatred. I give you a number of verses there uh, to uh, indicate that. We won't take time to read them now, but I hope as you're pondering this particular subject, you will read the numerous citations I have given there. Number nine, the wages of sin is eternal death and adultery is a sin. I just mentioned this obvious statement because, well, let's put it this way, of the literally millions of pages and hundreds and perhaps thousands of books which have been written upon AIDS, for example. What do you have? One book or two columns on AIDS? on Hades, on hell. You know what I mean by that, don't you? We think of AIDS. That's what I'm saying here. We think of AIDS, a horrible thing, unspeakable. The Surgeon General, a Christian man himself, is urging us to do everything in our power to prevent it. He knows full well it's greatest. He's a Christian man, and he knows full well its greatest danger is not what it's doing to American health, but what it's doing to the future of American people. It's securing their eternal damnation. He doesn't say that because as Surgeon General, he doesn't think it's his job to say that. As Surgeon General, he's to look after the health of the American people, and he's looking after the health of American people against its greatest pestilential threat, AIDS. He's telling us that. But if you draw Everett Coop aside, and ask him, what is the greatest danger connected with AIDS? And he talks to you as a private Christian and not a Surgeon General of the United States. If I know Everett Koop, he'll say to you, by far the greatest danger is that this is the product of sin, and the wages of sin is eternal death. The real terror in AIDS is not the health havoc that it wreaks and is threatening, but the eternal damnation which it is securing for many people, not because of the disease, but because it's a sign of the sin which produced the disease. Ten, and finally, adultery begins in the heart, and even if it stops there, that person is an adulterer, remember? We saw that murder starts in the heart, and though it stops there, a hating person is a murderer, so we see some will go to hell as murderers who never hurt anyone, not even a fly, and some will go to hell as adulterers who never touched a woman or a man. You know, when we read about the miracles of Jesus Christ, many people lament the fact that He's not here to do these miracles today. And many people can't stand the miracle working power's absence and actually have to invent that power themselves and claim they have it and that it's being exercised today just as it was in the days of Jesus. That's not the case. These miracles that Christ supremely wrought, the likes of which were never performed by anybody, and even the miracles which were in the hands of mere men have ceased for a couple thousand years. But people wouldn't feel desolate about that and tempted to imagine that they do have this continuing work if they realize what these miracles were to indicate. The real wonder of them was not that Christ raised the dead, not that he made the lame to walk, 
not that he made the blind to see. The real miracle that does continue by his disciples in far greater measure than it was done by him in the days of his flesh are the healing of the soul of which these miracles are mere indications. The clearest indication that we have of what I'm saying here is the healing of that paralytic born of four. Where you remember Jesus first said to him, thy sins be forgiven thee. The Pharisees and others who were present immediately said, who does this man think he is that he forgives sins? You remember how Christ answered that charge of blasphemy and he dared to forgive sins? You remember how he answered that? He didn't say, I am the Son of God. I am God incarnate. I am the only one who has the right to forgive sins. No, no, you know how he answered it? What he said was, which is greater? To say, thy sins be forgiven thee, or take up your bed and walk. But to show you that the Son of Man has a power to forgive sins, I say to this man, rise, take up your bed and walk. And he rose and he took up his pallet and he walked. Do you get the point? Christ is saying that a person who has the power in and of himself to do miracles. You see, Moses didn't have that power. Moses had that power directly from God. And the one time he forgot it, and actually struck that rock to bring out water in Moses' name, God was so angry with him that he would not allow him to go into the land of promise to which he was leading his people for 40 years. And the apostles were very, very careful when they wrought miracles to do it in the name of Jesus Christ or in God. No man ever in his own name did miracles except Jesus Christ, the God-man. The way he did miracles, not just his doing of miracles now, in the name of God or in the name of Christ, but in his own name, the way in which he did miracles proved that he was God and proved that as God he had the power to forgive sins. And it was one and the same thing for him to say of this paralytic, your sins be forgiven you, or rise, take up your bed, and walk. That's just the indication that I'm giving that the real significance of Christ's miracles, which are absolutely unique and never had a precedent or a successor, even when miracles were being performed by and in the name of God was to show that this man had far more than a power to make the blind see, the lame walk, and the dead rise. He had the power to forgive sin. And my friends, though no man today really has the power to say to the dead rise, and to the lame walk, and to the blind see, even I have the power to say to you, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved forever and forever. That's the real message of the miracles. I'm not handicapped because I can't, with a word, raise the dead. I can do something far, far greater than that. I can declare to you on the authority of Jesus Christ, you lame, you blind, you sufferers of AIDS, whatever your affliction may be, if you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you will be saved, body and soul, forever and forever. Who needs miracles?